Hello, everybody. Welcome to Teaching with Comics, an interactive workshop for educators. My name is Peter Carlson, and I am a literacy curriculum specialist for Green Dot Public Schools in Los Angeles, California. I'm also the co-editor of a recently published book, With Great Power Comes Great Pedagogy, Teaching, Learning, and Comics. With me, with, with me here at the start are my good friends and co-editors, Susan Kirtley, the Director of Rhetoric and Composition, and also the Director of Comic Studies at Portland State University, as well as Antero Garcia, a professor at Stanford University's Graduate School of Education. Now, we have facilitated a Teaching with Comics workshop at San Diego Comic-Con for the past five years, and every year we hope to bring together an eclectic group of people to share practices in comic pedagogy. Our intent with the workshops and subsequently the book is to continually engage a dialogue about the purposeful use and power of comics in all classrooms. We are extremely excited to bring this year's panel directly into your homes and we hope you find some humor, some insight, some activities to try, some readings to discover, and all the while have a whole lot of fun. With that, I present Susan Kirtley. Thank you. Uh I'm excited. One of my highlights every year is going to San Diego Comic-Con and joining in this conversation with teachers, creators, professors, fans, and readers of comics about comics pedagogy. So it's one of my favorite times of the year. So I'm excited to present this virtual uh, conversation. Uh, we're going to be joined um, today by Nick Susanis, who is a um, professor at San Francisco State and the author of the amazing book, Unflattening, um, Ebony Flowers. Uh, um, amazing teacher, also um, creator of uh, Hot Comb, also Eisner nominated. And finally, we'll be chatting with um, comics legends, uh, Brian Michael Bendis and David Walker this year. They're, they have many Eisner nominations this year. They're nominated for their collaboration, Naomi. So we're gonna be chatting with them. Um, and really one of the hallmarks of these workshops is just having a conversation um, and, and we are, presenting these conversations to you. We hope to um, have a conversation in person soon at a Comic-Con. Um, if you wanna have, um, find some more information about um, our creators and um, that we're talking to today, um, we'll have a link at the end to our book, which you can get at the library. I'm not shilling you, you know, I just, you know, you can get it at the library, please do. But um, it really um, highlights some of these ama amazing creators and a lot of other folks um, a lot more information. So we look forward to continuing this conversation online, in person, and so forth. So thank you and welcome. No, I'll just add that we have a link somewhere, it's floating around, uh, maybe somewhere in this video, uh, to, uh, to the, the book's website. And there is an excerpt, if you click on the excerpt button, that will take you to nearly half of the volume is free for folks to read online. As we know, it's, it's difficult to get into bookstores or libraries right now. So please uh, look at half of it. The other half's just as great. So please uh, uh, locate uh, different ways to, to check it out. Uh, this year's workshop is uh, our three pres presentations are really focused on comic creation, that we're going to talk about how you make comics uh, and what that looks like, the kinds of tensions you might have as a writer and putting your heart into social justice movements in writing. To, if you don't think you're a good artist, what's it mean to draw silly pictures and, and take your work seriously and playfully at the same time. And so recognizing that uh, many of you watching this might be educators who don't have an interest in being comic creators, I'm going to recognize that as you're watching these videos, think about what are the ways that you might be able to bring comic production into your classroom, regardless of subject area, regardless of age group that you're teaching. Um, there, there's some real opportunities there. I also want to think about across all of these, you know, really powerful comic creators, what are the ways that comics as a medium can function as, an in, as a source of inquiry for you and for the subjects that you're engaging in? No matter what topic or age group that you're working with, there are uh, a bevy of graphic novels and comic books and resources that are, are available to explore as well as to be created. Uh, and so in this way, this is also just an opportunity for you to recognize that as an educator, you are a creator. And whether or not that, that is a medium that is happening across three or nine panels uh, on a page at any given time, you are making stuff every day right? and you're making multimodal work every day. And so I would take the kinds of design and uh, the invitation to fail spectacularly and, and draw outside the lines and take those invitations seriously across all dimensions of your pedagogy. And so with that being said, we're gonna jump into our first panel, our, uh, our first presentation uh, from Nick Susanis, again from San Francisco State. And so uh, thank you for joining us. Let's 
thank you for being here with us. Mm -hmm. um, for having me. <laughs> I wanted to open by asking you a little bit about collaboration because you've written about um, working with um, Frederick Kohler, who couldn't be here today, but um, you co-taught a class with him. And I feel like collaboration is a, obviously an important part in making comics, but it's also an important part in teaching. And um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your experience collaborating with Frederick and, and, and teaching comics. Yeah, I'm sorry Frederick couldn't be here, but um, but we had the best time. Um, we were both postdocs at the University of Calgary, and I taught a class in the fall, uh, a solo class, a small class, and then we were teaching Bart Beatty's large survey co course. And I, I was supposed to do it, and I invited Frederick to do it for various reasons, without really even knowing him at that point. And um, and then we just, we, like I said, we, we had the best time, and, and it was really, you know, we both came come from very different places and in, in what we're interested in, in comics and what we teach in comics. And so the class from designing the class at the start, which we, you know, we, we, you know, we went back and forth on all these ideas to each day's class, um, to the very exercises that we did in class. So we did these, uh, these things on note cards, each class, it was sort of an attendance, sort of as a way to get, you know, all my classes were based on hands-on activities or like, how do you do this in a room of 70 people and, still make it useful and so we we did this thing on note cards where they had five minutes of every class they had to do this thing and they just hand it to us so if you were there and you handed it in you did it and they're really cool i, I think there's some reproduced in the book um but uh um so so each before each class we spent a lot of time brainstorming on what we wanted to do and our in-class things you know we we put our slides together and I'd talk for a little while and then Frederick would talk for a little while and then we would comment on each other as well. So it really, I, I wouldn't say it was easier. I mean, um, I, you know, we, we probably spent more time preparing because we had to make sure the other person felt good about it, but we also very quickly found new ideas that we wouldn't have. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's just, there's so many blind spots we have in our own approach that having this other voice there or this other perspective there could really open it. Um, and, and there's funny things too. I mean, I, I don't put any words on my slides um, and Frederick, Frederick tends to have a few, you know, like here's some key points and he'll put them on. And we noticed this thing when we would switch between who was doing what, um, if I was talking they're they're like looking up and then Frederick would come on and he would put a word slide on and all of a sudden the students' heads would go down and they'd start writing down whatever he'd written on the thing. And so, you know, but then we'd notice it. So we'd talk to them about it and it, it just, it really became a generative experience. Um, so I think the, I would love to do it again. I think universities struggle to figure out how to make these things work. I mean, in the sort of uh, the ways that assignments are allocated, but, but it's, I'm, I'm sure it can be disastrous, but in our case, I, I would love to do it you know, I, I would do it ongoing um, because I think it makes me think of things and it's, it's just, it, it, it's, it's more of an enriching experience. Yeah, that, I mean, and that, you know, in, in the, in bringing the making uh, to the forefront, you know, it, it does, you know, educators can find that that enables student voice in a way that just kind of untaps it at the beginning even when they don't have a, you know, a, a, as much of a theoretical or even the vocabulary uh, you know, internalized yet, but through the making, they can, they can gain a fluency. But, you know, you also mentioned in your chapter how much, um, how much play matters. And I think that's both that for, you know, in the making for the students, finding that, that element of play, but even when you were referencing collaboration and, and working with Frederick and how fun that was and how mm -hmm. essential, even for the, for the teacher, for the educator, how play should also be a part of, of the classroom experience. Yeah, I think, and I now want to respond with a bunch of things to that, if, that's, if this is a good point to respond. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, but I think, I mean, play is such an interesting thing that we're also defensive about, you know, like every week there's a study that shows how much you learn through play. And then every week there's an administrator that like doesn't allow that in your school system or in your thing. So it's a, and I think we catch ourselves. I think that same experience I had is to say, well, now we're going to switch to the real scholarship because we're just playing around. But I think, you know, when you have students look at, I mean, I think that's what's so interesting about having them all make stuff, you know, here's a prompt. 
go home and uh, make a comic about how you got here and do it in three panels and do it in two pages. Do the same, you know, it doesn't have to be the same story, but it's the same prompt. Um, and, and then they all come back and they can compare their own. You know, here's the choices I made when I did it in three and here's the choices I made when I did it in two pages. And then they've got, you know, 15 to 25 other, other students in the class to compare and look at all the choices and all the decisions you make um, when you're playing, right? You know, or, I mean, my grids exercise, which I do in seven minutes to an audience that's usually a little bit like, what is he talking about? Why is he being so ambiguous with this? And, and then, you know, I come around and I look at it like, why did you make squiggly lines here? Why did you have a dashed line on your box? Why do these two overlap? And like, you've made an astounding number of choices in a, in a small amount of time with no experience. So you're doing something incredibly thoughtful and incredibly considered, but before you wouldn't have thought it was that, right? You would have thought you were just playing or you were just, um, I think I talk about it in the book, but the, 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 uh, I had this woman, I, we did this exercise uh, in a workshop and she was a very serious journalist and, prize-winning journalist and very serious person and she's like I you know I don't I don't normally I don't like this artsy stuff but she'd made this like crazy cra like it was like so complicated and all these things and I said you know that's not really a piece of art that's a piece of thinking and and that really stayed with me like you know I mean I was just on the spot saying it but like that's that's what we're trying to do I mean uh, you know and, and that's what I think about in my students it's it's less about you know, some of them will go on and become like comics makers in a formal sense, whatever that means. But but most of them, I'm hoping that they can get an insight, insight into their own thinking and insight into their own ways of working that will carry them in whatever they do and whatever they make, um, that this is really helpful to them. And, and I think, you know, I think of my own work, like, you know, as a comics maker, as a kid, I have this sort of lull in it. And then I, I come back to it before I go to the doctoral school to do it. But it's my goal in doing it then was to bring access to the work, right? It was to like bring people in because I could, what I could do with images and metaphorical images, I thought could bring people into the conversation. But, but I think what I came out of it with is, is that's true. But what, what I also learned is that, that it allowed me to think in a very different way. And it allowed me to understand things about my thinking and make connections that I simply couldn't do in another art form. So it, it, to me, it's very, yes, it's about drawing, but it's really about this sort of visualizing that, that has nothing to do with drawing skill. It has everything to do with sort of the ways we conceive of things spatially and the way our, you know, our bodies and brains work that, that, is, that is really discounted. And it's really discounted in classrooms where we're supposed to sit in desks and like not move our bodies. And, and, you know, I, I pull my students all the time, like, how many of you got in trouble for drawing in class? And, you know, most of the hands go up. And, yeah, and we need to, we need to think about play and movement a lot in our classrooms. I, I have to say, I have um, used some of your exercise, ex exercises as a teacher. And for me, selfishly, it's that play, bringing play is such an important thing in terms of teaching because it makes my job more fun and if i'm having more fun i think students are having more fun um and i think i mean that's really important and i also w wanted to um, sort of emphasize one of the points you made about um comics as a way of thinking through ideas because i i think for some teachers it might be intimidating to incorporate these exercises i am not a great artist i'm a terrible artist but i always try to do whatever i ask my students to do so I'll create these terrible comics and share them. And I think, I think that's a good thing, you know, to, to mm -hmm. be vulnerable like that, but to also, um, you know, show them that it, you know, the aesthetics don't always matter. Um, and that, you know, like I did this little comic about like this experience I had as a child. And as I did the comic, I was like trying to distill it down to the essence. And I'm like, oh, so that's what was it really important about that event. So for me, I, doing these exercises, even though I'm not a good artist, I, it's helped sort of show me, oh yeah, this is a way of thinking through the past and the present and the future and what's really important. So for me, even though I'm not a great artist and I'm intimidated and inevitably there are great artists in the class, it doesn't matter, you know? So I, I've had really great um, experiences, even though I'm more of a theory person just doing it, doing these activities with the classes. So I've taken, I've taken your ideas and 
use them. And so thank you. It's been mm -hmm. a lot of, I think, fun, which is great. Yeah. But also sort of shows me, yeah, this is a way of communicating comics. Mm -hmm. It's a way of thinking. Right. I think that's it's interesting. I wish I, I'd kept track of how many times you said I'm not a great artist in that statement. But um, but I think I mean, what's in, what's interesting to me, I mean, there's a couple points there is that the, the, the longer excerpt, I think, uh, that's reproduced in the chapter from this student is the thing I have shown the most at like every talk I have given to every class I've had. Um, and this is a student who absolutely wouldn't say is not an artist by any conventional standards. Yet it is one of the most thoughtful and, and sort of uh, thought provoking pieces I've ever had. And I think, you know, she, her skills changed very little from day one to day, you know, the end of semester. Um, but her ability to use the form to think changed a lot. So I don't, you know, I mean, I think that's one of the beauties of comics is that you can draw in this sort of, you know, like I draw in this overly complicated, laborious way. And I, I kind of like to let go of some of that. But, um, but you can do that. But you can also come at it in these very spare, I mean, I think that's one of the beauties of Linda Berry's work. And, um, you know, you're, you're going to hear from Ebony as well. I think that's, that's something she's going to speak to um that uh you know that that you can be just as profound in your meaning and and meaning making uh whatever your form but I, I mean i think finding that thing you know i think moving past like i i don't draw well and this is what i'm gonna do to finding like oh this works for me and i i think of a student i've had he was a he's a, a cross-country runner and a, i don't know it might be a kinesiology major but he I was interested in comics and he's taken a couple of my making courses in addition to the intro on it he was making some not really good and he's not a great drawer and they weren't very interesting comics and and then he had this breakthrough and i don't i don't remember the kind of pen he made was using but just he found this like really clean way to make very simplified characters um and it actually i think it was responding to matt madden's 99 ways to tell a story um he did a matt madden as a christmas tree um because we, we'd add a pay and and it was you know like it was as spare as it gets um but his comics I, I, that might be wrong that it, he definitely did that but i might may have been an, a later piece but um but all of a sudden he found this like really clean way that he could do comics that were really good and he made one this year about sort of isolation and separation from his parents because of this moment um, that was actually playing off of an exercise I made up for our Zoom thing where they had to like each panel, they had to try inking in a different way. That was the only prompt, like just, you know, like this one stipple, this one uh, feather, this one, whatever, you know, like black silhouette, something, some, some kind of set of prompts. And, uh, and he made this incredibly powerful comic about his, you know, separation in the time of, of pandemic and using all these, you know, very, these techniques, but with his style. And again, you know, he's not a great drawer by the standards of Windsor McKay behind me or something like that, right? But, but he found his way. Um, so I, 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 yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think great drawer is really, it, 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 it's why I like starting with that grids exercise, because when you can understand that drawing isn't it's not about craft as much as it is about thinking and space that I, I think it can liberate people to find all their own ways to do things. Um, even you, Susan, especially you, Susan. <laughs> I love that though, that idea of the liberation and finding your, finding your own way, whatever, whatever that looks like. So yeah, that's fantastic. I think, I think that's a great place for us to end. If sure. If it's Perfect. good for you. Yeah, um, thank you so much. Our next presenter is Ebony Flowers, the Eisner-nominated author of Hot Comb and the teacher who is also going to share a lot of the, the practices she's used in classrooms in creating comics. And so, Ebony, take it away. All right, we are here. Uh, we are so excited to be here with Ebony Flowers. Ebony, thank you for joining us. You're in, are you in Denver right now at this second? I am in Denver right now. Yes, I am. All right, we can we can hear the altitude uh, on the. On the <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so, Ebony, we want to talk to you just being, I'm a huge fan of, uh, of your book. And I think one thing we're hoping is you can talk about, uh, I am a terrible artist. I can't speak for Susan. Um, but yeah. it seems like you've been doing a bunch of workshops lately and have been kind of thinking through how to support people in engaging in the comic making process, um, even if even if we may not feel artistically inclined. Yeah, so um, I started making comics and started drawing uh, as a practice or just drawing in general when I was uh, 31 and I'm 39 now, so it hasn't been that long and my background's in biology and anthropology and I used to be a high school biology and environmental science teacher. I taught middle school math, like algebra and pre-calculus for a while. So I definitely never really thought of myself as an artist. It wasn't known. Other people didn't know me as the person to go to to draw like Scooby-Doo. Um, and so, um, so when I teach uh, making comics or when I, I do these workshops, um, I usually start off with like very, uh, a very simple um, way of approaching how to draw a person because that's usually what most people are afraid to do um, when they think that they can't draw or they, they abandoned drawing a long time ago. Maybe they haven't picked up a, a pencil to draw since they're like maybe in third grade. Um, I I try to get folks away from using stick figures and their drawings because what I was told by um, my my former teacher and now mentor Linda Berry is that you know when you draw stick figures um, everyone ends up with a penis and I don't know if everyone wants that <laughs> in their drawings and so um, uh, the video that um, is linked in this video is uh, an instructional on how to do self portraits using um, simple shapes like circles, uh, triangles, and rectangles, and it's based off of, um, let me, I'm going to get up for a second. This is one of the perks of working from home. No. Uh, okay, so it's based off of the style by um, Ivan Brunetti. This is one of his books, but he actually, I was trying to find it, but I don't know where it is in um, my bookshelf. So it's Ivan Brunetti, and he has a book now called um, Cartooning Easy as um, ABC. And he also has another book called um, Cartooning um, Philosophy and Practice. And if you can see here, he uses very simple shapes to draw people and to draw his background. And so that's what I start out with, um, with um, folks when I, when I teach this in my workshops. And so um, what I have linked is a short video on how to draw self-portraits. And I have this here because they're drawn on index cards, but you can um, use regular copy paper and just uh, break it down into um, into rectangles, so four rectangles. And you play a song, and you use the style of Ivan Brunetti to draw yourself full body from head to toe. And I usually, when I teach this, I usually have themes, and so um, one is for example, draw yourself in outer space, draw yourself as a rock star, draw yourself on the beach, um, and to keep drawing for the entire time the song is on. And usually it's like a three to four minute song. Does, does it um, matter which song it is? Is it? No, it doesn't. And so, okay, and, and so if you, if for folks who are, are going to watch this uh, video, this instructional video and do this, Apologies in advance. I, I use the song in Zoom or Zoom or whatever like recording devices are just horrible for um, for for music. And so, if the music is distracting, what I'm playing, just play your own song for a few minutes um, while you draw. And so, yeah. Do you? Sorry, I, I'm I'm gonna pick on the song one more time. Is does the song have to help with your theme? Are you? Is there a link here or it's just to help guide the, the piece? No, it could be anything. I, I want to actually show some self-portraits. Uh, okay, so I was on this, um, I don't know about you guys, but uh, we're, we're quarantined now. And um, and in Denver, people are, are giving up their face masks. And so we're just throwing them out and just kind of walking out now because I guess people are sick of it. So. 
I've started to draw this series called uh, Reclaim Face Masks, where I pretend that I go around. I don't actually do this, but I pretend and go around uh, the city to pick up discarded face masks, and I and I make them into other things. So this is so this is a self portrait of me walking through town, picking up face masks. So so this is what I talk about when I when I say like um, using like simple shapes and, and drawing another. I remember Nettie's style, um, and to not think too much about it. Um, so, so this is me re making a kite out of all of my face masks. This is me. I don't sew, but this is me sewing the face masks together. Um, apron, yeah. So, anyway, um, yeah. So that's what the that video will show folks how to do and it's and I think this is a great exercise um, to do right in the beginning um, to warm people's hands up to get them ready to do other kind of uh, drawing and writing activities that are associated um, with making comics. Can I ask, can I ask two follow-up questions? Do you yeah. So one, so as you're sharing those examples which are really helpful for, for me to understand, uh, you had different poses in terms of like your where your body was oriented do you have a good like is there a suggestion on how people should be placing their bodies and like if the camera is like looking on uh um no okay pause i'll get it more examples i have like hundreds of these that's great um so this is me as a rock star um I and this is even more like a simple shapes and stuff and this is a, a profile um what i usually say and if you notice my hands are just like little snowballs um and so what i usually say is uh make sure you have your whole body in the drawing so just make sure you have your head there and the hair and that your hands are visible and that your feet are visible and i and that you're facing forward so you can kind of have different angles but not the back side because there's a tendency for folks who are self-conscious about how they draw to like hide the hands behind the back or in the pockets or to have you know to turn around and so we want to avoid all of that and the best way is just to say it right off in the beginning got it and, and then the other question i have i'm thinking about if i was to do this activity with my my ninth graders many years ago there would be several students in the class who they they would make an immediately they'd make like half a line and immediately crumple up the paper say they messed up and need to start over and i'm wondering do you have tips on like breaking that kind of like it needs to be perfect or i can't do this mentality um yeah so what i do is i tr when i teach this i um i draw oh, i wish i had my whiteboard clean but i i, I draw first yeah and I, I instantly lower everyone's expectations. Okay. And because as soon as they know that I'm a published author, an award winning published author, and then they see me draw this, they're like, I'm okay. Published author. <laughs> yeah. Anything goes. And, and, and I've had several students of mine tell me that they, they felt much better once they saw me draw. Um, because there's, there's, um, what I've noticed and what I've been taught is that there's two two different ways of drawing when you're making comics. It's drawing fast and drawing slow. Mm -hmm. And this uh, self-portrait activity is definitely one where you're drawing fast. And it's an important skill when you're making comics just to have because you're um, to tell stories and to use panels telling stories. And it takes, um, you're drawing a lot and it takes a lot of time. Um, and sometimes the story comes out so fast that it's good to to um, to have that skill of being able to draw quickly without being self conscious of of your own drawing so that you can just get the story out and then later, if you want to go through and redraw things and to to clean it up that's totally fine but it's it is good to have um this the skill of uh, being able to draw quickly in your pocket. It, it reminds me a little bit, I was reading your work about copying, which is the, the sort of the liberating power of copying, um, you know, in the classroom. Yeah. And I think that that term copying strikes fear. It, you know, it seems really scary for 
a lot of people, because you know, there's that sense like, oh, you're copying off me, but I like the way yeah. you talk about copy copying is sort of liberating and a place to start. And um, I wonder if you could just say a little bit more, because because that I feel like for me as a non, as someone who doesn't consider myself an artist, I feel like maybe I could copy, you know, or, or you know, that would be a good place to start. Could you tell a little, talk a little bit about how you use copying in your class? Um, well, we started copying, so I started introducing that and making comics when I was um, working with Linda and we were being kind of like experimental with how to teach folks how to um, make comics who don't have that um, artistic formal um, training in the arts. And in one way we found to be like fun and also um, useful is copying and not just, we do copying pictures, but not We've done that, but not as much as copying one another in real time. Um, and it becomes kind of like a game, you know, how not all preschoolers, but, you know, we notice that a few preschoolers, when you're copying them or when they're copying with each other, it's more about the experience of copying one, one another rather than the final um, end product of the picture. And so um, we like doing that one because it kind of loosens again loosens people up and gets them used to this idea of, of drawing quickly and drawing um, for the purpose of creating a story rather than creating a, a, a Rembrandt and then also it allows people to experiment with one another's drawing styles and so for instance if you like to say the way I did my eyebrows suddenly we're paired up and you can see how I draw the, my eyebrows in that way and and um, take it on as your own thing. I think a lot of people when they hear the word copying, especially with drawing, they think, oh, I don't want to steal that person's style. And I understand that, you know, um, because that happens a lot in the artistic world, like appropriation of another, like, particularly like another cultural style that's very specific to a group of people. Um, but in this instance, for like making comics, um, what happens is that after a while, the line becomes your own without really trying. Um, and so, especially when you're working off of other people rather than just working off of a straight picture. But I am totally fine with people copying um, pictures from their favorite uh, cartoonists too, because that's really helpful. Um, even as you were talking, I thought, oh, snowball hands. I can do that, you know? Yeah, exactly. Because like, oh. <laughs> I'm like, well, okay, maybe I could do, because I'm the kind of person who would hide the hands. And But as you were saying that, I was like, and showing that example, I was like, oh, okay. That, yeah, you know, just a snowball. Like, oh, yeah, I could do a snowball hand, I think, you know? So even in that little example, it was kind of, it was like liberating, like, oh, well, I could do that. Yeah, see, this is me lowering expectations of what counts as a drawing. That's 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 what I like to do. <laughs> more more preschoolers, less Rembrandt seems like the the guidance on, on how to be a successful artist. This is the that's great. Yeah, a good cartoonist because little kids, if they're in the groove, they'll just draw a lot forever. So awesome. well, I don't know about Rembrandt, but we are anyway. <laughs> so grateful to get to learn with you. This has been a real pleasure. So thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this was, yeah, this was awesome. Um... Our final conversation is with uh, two folks who really don't need introductions, but I will just introduce um, Brian Michael Bendis and David Walker. They are comics legends, um, writers of great renown. Um, this year I'm excited that they're um, nominated, have multiple Eisner nominations, including their collaboration, Naomi. So um, we're going to have a nice um, chat with Brian Michael Mendes and David Walker. So um, I think we're all excited to talk to you um, both um, about teaching comics. And I was uh, reviewing uh, the interview that um, that you guys did with Johnny Parker for the anthology that we worked on. And Brian, you mentioned um, that, quote, school is never out, which I think would be um, terrifying for some folks, um, th students. Um, but I wondered as, you know, educators and lifelong learners, what you both might 
have to say about this concept of the importance of never lose, leaving school behind. David, you want to? Oh, I start? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, it's, I, I agree with Brian. School is never out. And, and so we've been in this very interesting, unprecedented time with the pandemic. And, and one of the things that I've been trying to do is, as a lot of creators have been trying to do, is like figure out, you know, what are we going to do next? You know, how do we keep our careers going? How do we keep this industry going? And, and so to that end, I've gone back and I've looked at a lot of stuff from the past, really studying how um, the actual beginnings of what comic books were, uh, which were, you know, collections of newspaper strips, and then studying what people like Will Eisner was doing, and then Bernard Krigstein, and, and then the, the early pioneers of the graphic novel, really going back into the roots of this, this medium and this craft and discovering stuff that I either never knew or for, had forgotten, you know, like like the art, the work of Gil Kane, who was a, I was a huge fan of his when I was a kid, but suddenly it's like, okay, wait a sec, now I'm reading these old interviews with him, and, and the guy was definitely a, you know, um, a rabble rouser, and, and then again, going back and looking at what Will Eisner did, and feeling for one of the first times in a very long time, like comics seem brand new to me, but it's brand new because I'm looking at stuff that's like 50, 60, maybe even 70 years old. And it's like, it's amazing. And, and I, I, I haven't pestered Brian with it too much, but there's other creators that I'm almost daily taking pictures of, whether it's Gil Kane or Will Eisner or Alex Toth work and just going, look at this. This is, you know, this is better than anything that's being done today. Like, like we're, not, we're not reinventing the wheel. We're just standing on the shoulders of giants. My first class I ever took was by Gil Kane. Gil Kane taught an art class at a Cleveland convention. And my dad didn't know who Gil Kane was. <laughs> I, I didn't know who Gil Kane was. But I ended up in, a, in an art class taught by a very feisty Gil <laughs> Kane. I, I remember every word of it. It was decades ago. I remember every word of it because he was so angry. And I was so <laughs> delighted. It was the angry, I'm Jewish and he's the angriest Jew I'd ever met. I go, I want to grow up and be this. Anyway, so, um, but it was, it was a life-changing uh, experience for me. I, and I, I can't help but connect it to my head, like why I wanted to teach versus that crazy class I took by Gil Kane. Yeah, and, and now when I tell people that, they're like, what? It, it sounds <laughs> insane to take a drawing class by Gil Kane. So, yeah. But uh, for, for me, um, when I was younger, uh, I, I was very hungry for information that wasn't available to me on any level, pre-internet, because I'm old. And, uh, um, but, but with that, you feel like an archeologist, like no one, there's no classes, there's no book on it. The Will Eisner book wasn't um, uh, widely distributed at the time. Like you can get it now, you couldn't get it then. And so I was so hungry for information uh, uh, that I would literally scour back issues of Comic Buyer's Guide and Comic Scene Magazine looking for any kind of tutorial, anything about what, what pen should an inker use. And I did, I remember I felt, I felt like you're like digging for gold everywhere you, you look. So when um, I went, I ended up at a very nice art school um, and they let me in. I kind of like willed my way in even though my talent wasn't there. And um, when I got there, they weren't interested in comics at all. They were they absolutely no interest. Uh, I whined and cried and carry on until they just put me in the corner to do independent study, which is literally just go go sit over there and shush. But <laughs> but it, it was what I needed. I just needed to make a comic book and figure out what I didn't know. And I think about that all the time when we're teaching that feeling that I had, what I what I needed to know, what I didn't know. So we crafted a class that fulfills that, like who, who, like what, what I think I needed from my, my, my college um, uh, situation. And so we created a class that's um, equal parts craft and philosophy and history, because you literally can't do the craft unless you have some comic book philosophy behind it and some knowledge of how we got here. Right. So even though a lot of our students come from different walks of life or have entered the medium through uh, different things than what inspired us, 
it, it all got us here, whether it's European comics, Japanese comics, manga, um, in, uh, indie, he, Raina, whatever it is that got you to this class, we have to back up the truck a little bit and, and show you how we got here and what your place in it is. Because every generation, uh, like music and movies, we're stepping on the shoulders of our heroes to get to a better truth and to get to a more pure version of the form for this generation. So you got to know whose shoulder you're standing on. So, and we've had that too with our, with our class. You can tell they just want to get to work. I'm like, no, you're going to listen to Jack Kirby talk for a little bit <laughs> and, 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 and then we'll get there. But we've also had that great experience where, the, you know, a student came in for a very um, narrow focus project that they're, they want to do. And when you open up the horizons and go, oh my, I had no idea. Like they didn't know who the Hernandez brothers are and I'm doing exactly what they did. Yeah. And so that's been one of our favorite parts of teaching the class is connecting the history to the present looking towards the future. I love that speculative approach to the role that comics can play and that teaching around comics can play. And Brian, you frame this as the getting to a better truth, right, in terms of the work. And I want to link that to David. You talked at the beginning around, you framed the kind of scholarship and the, the historical digging you're doing as within this current unprecedented time. Uh, and so one of, one of the quotes, David, that you had, you may not remember you had from, from the book, uh, was you talked about the human agenda that you carry into your writing and into your, your comics work. Uh, and so one question we have is, as we think about this unprecedented time, both the pandemic, both the kinds of confrontations around historic racial violence that we're seeing in this country right now, uh, I'm curious, you know, what are the pedagogical roles that you might see yourselves as writers? What, what are the ways that you carry that human agenda into your work? Uh, and is that, Brian, I don't know if that relates to the getting to a better truth in terms of the work. So I'm trying to muddle and throw as many of these buzzwords out and see what, 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 what gets picked up. There. Well, I can tell you the, uh, a few weeks ago as, as I was watching the news and uh, it was, it was the, the first night of the, the protests uh, in Minneapolis after the murder of George Floyd and, and then progressively we watch city after city start to burn and people protesting and 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 the entire time I was watching that I was thinking well I knew this was coming and and part of the reason I knew this was coming because I'd read the Kerner Commission's report as part of research for a graphic novel that I just finished writing on the Black Panther Party and um, and and so I started talking to people and explaining to them what what you're seeing in the news right now is is nothing new. Um, it's happened before and, and it was foretold in 1968. And, and in six months, there's going to be a comic book, a graphic novel that's going to come out and you're going to learn more than you ever thought you would know about um, the history of police brutality and the history of organized resistance. And, and to me, it's, um, I, I think about that all the time. I think about everything that comics gave me when I was a kid. And it was a lot, you know, I, um, I grew up reading Classics Illustrated and, and, and some of those classic adaptations of, of Moby Dick and, you know, uh, Tale of Two Cities in, in the comic format. And, you know, I was probably the only fifth grader that, that really knew who Charles Dickens and, and Herman Melville were because I'd read the comic versions of them. And, and so I think that this medium is such a beautiful entry point to so many different things, whether it's um, to educate people or to provide an escape for people. It can do both. And sometimes you can do both in one, um, one felt swoop. And, and I just, I do, I think about that. I, I did another one of these uh, stay at home panels earlier today and, and we were talking about that. And I was just, I was really reflecting on how much of my interest in learning came from comics because I was, they didn't have terms for it when I was a kid, but I was, I was a, a visual learner. You know, I was, instead they said I was slow and put me in all the remedial classes because I didn't like reading books that didn't have pictures. And, and now I get it. I understand why I was labeled that way. And so part of my agenda and human agenda is to um, help to craft stuff for kids like me who would look at a book and say, well, there's no pictures in here. I, I, I don't, 
almost not know how to read it, basically. I mean, I knew how to read, but it just didn't engage me. Your turn, Brian. Oh uh, yeah, well, I would. Um, for me, it's just like anyone who who heads towards a class like ours. There's a drive there. It isn't just oh cool comics easy A. That's not it. it, it it's never the case. They're they're here because there, there's a truth inside them that they want to express, and the road to expressing that can seem like you can't even find it. You just just a big black cloud in front of you, and you have to like journey forth. And and you can see it no matter where. The person came from and no matter what that truth is whether it's something seemingly frivolous like a story about my cat or here's some traumatic thing that i'm going to express no matter what it is it's equally important to that person to be able to express it and somehow the very the very elegant idea that many writers have expressed that the more specific you get with your writing the more universal it becomes to an audience uh, it seems like an insane thing until you've done it and experienced it. Like I, I, I've had it, we've all had it. We're like, well, I'm, I grew up in Cleveland. I'm going to write about Cleveland. Nobody cares about Cleveland. Who cares about Cleveland? And then I wrote about Cleveland and people cared. And like, it, and like oh, it's, it's, it's a magical place to somebody else. Everywhere is, no matter how it feels like to you, I, mean, I grew up in this shit town. But if you write with great detail and, and warm truth about whatever you're writing about, people will reflect to it. And you have to really go through that whole process of making something, putting it out, and getting the response back to feel, oh, that it does work. Oh, okay, it, it works for everybody. That's fascinating. So a lot of our class is about just getting you as close to your truth as possible, building up that like inner strength of, yes, you can write about yourself. And even if you screw it all up, the world will continue to turn. <laughs> And, uh, and I think for David and I, one of the blessings is because we are working creators uh, in a field, um, we can, uh, A, it, it gives a little bit of an empowerment to the students. So like, well, they must know what they're talking about on some level, like, you know, <laughs> and also we can point to a road of failure behind us, like, look, look, and a public failure. Look, we fell on our ass. I blew it. I completely screwed this up. And everybody saw it. And people made fun of me on the internet, and all that, all the all the fears that um, uh, people like us, who uh, our nature is to stay home alone and not, you know, just I, I want to be in my bubble. But stepping out of that bubble can be scary. We have stepped out. We have we have um, had all the failure and all the success you can have, and everything's fine. Like that, and just that can empower people. Oh look, Brian just got beat up by Nazis online, and he's fine. So. <laughs> So I, 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 I like just to use our personal example and also kind of celebrate failure as much as possible on, uh, um, because it's so important to the process and something that um, Instagram kind of like, just the, the, uh, kind of takes it away. Like don't show your failure, don't show your flaws, don't show your, you know, whatever it is, it may make it your most ideal self, no matter how real it is. And, but that failure really is when you find out, oh, I, 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 I know who I am because I did this. So I, I, I like to kind of like take speci specifically this generation back to a place where it's okay to fail. In fact, you should be aiming for it on some level. Like how, how, how many steps can I take before I fall off this thing? That's, that's what writing can feel like. And we want, we want them to get there and not, not cower back. Because it is that people who grew up with social media Failing can seem like uh, like like overwhelming. Yeah, like like I'll never recover from it, and um, and that's not what happens. And it's and it's also interesting because when Brian talks about failure, going back to what I was saying earlier about studying the the older works of Gil Kane and Will Eisner and and <clears throat> and some of these other folks, by their definition, especially I would say Gil Kane's definition, some of his most bold work was would be considered failures you know black mark and, and savage um and and but it's like i'm learning so much from it and and these guys never stopped they were just like oh okay you know um the, the comics industry in those days was like yeah if you mess up you still got a deadline 28 days later so um i, yeah, I the only thing you could mess up back then is the deadline exactly and and yeah, i think Brian, the page, so. when brian talks about the 
the truth, one of the things that I try to push with the students and really emphasize is that um, that you you have to complete something um, because if you don't complete it, you won't know what that process is like and you will forever be stuck in the, oh, I almost have it done. I've, I've got my, you know, um, 20,000 words away from finishing my first manuscript, but I've been 20,000 words away for the last 10 years. And it's like, finish that first draft. And even if it's terrible, you can fix it. I mean, um, and I actually went back to my old school, the Peden Institute of Art, and they asked me to do a speech. And that was very strange because I was not uh, a good student or finished. And, um, and so I was there. Uh, having that surreal moment, and I brought up as 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 a as a teacher, finish what you start. You have to whatever the project is. Don't just worry about the first two or ten pages that every everyone over you know rewrites and rewrites and rewrites. Get all the way to the end and work on those last ten pages over and over and over again, uh, and uh, because that's how you find out what you're really writing and why you wrote it. Like you, you might think you know why, but you do not know until you finish it. You absolutely don't, no matter what it's about. It could be about a puppy and his little sled. You still won't know what it's about until you get to the end. And when I said this, the other teachers, uh, some of which were my teachers, ran, ran up to me and were like, thank you, that is our number one problem as educators. Nobody finishes what they start, and they don't know what kind of writers they are. They don't know why they're here. You're absolutely right. But they said it with such passion that it carried with me, and I bring it up almost everywhere I go, and I get the same response from someone. Like, that's still the number, the number one lesson that has to be learned, whether you're in a class or just watching stuff like this online like I do all the time. Finish what you start. You'll find out who you are. That's the only way.